welcome to Half the Battle. Well, it's time to go back to the comic this week. And since we've spent the last two weeks talking about Dreadnoughts, it's a happy coincidence that our next comic has them on the cover, promising a fun Dreadnought tale. Except this cover lies! It's a huge pile of stinking lies! More so than any cover that has come before it! It's issue 32, titled The Mountain. Insert your own Game of Thrones joke here. It picks up right after the end of the last issue, where we saw everybody getting shot and Snake Eyes' cabin exploded, with him in it. I'm sure he's fine. The opening page shows everybody pretty much dead. Well, short issue, but very moving. See you next time, everybody. Wait. It looks like at least Destro isn't quite dead yet. So, let's see where this goes. A mysterious mountain climber shows up, and we get some extremely cringy dialogue from G.I. Joe stereotype number 347. You speak to vultures. You have medicine powers. You have the hand that heals and the eye that sees. And I have the eyes that roll. Destro launches his wrist rockets. But the Mountaineer swats them away without even looking at them. He reveals himself to be the Soft Master. And here's where skipping Snake Eyes the Origin really comes back to bite me in the ass. Long story short, the Soft Master is a ninja trainer and Snake Eyes was his pupil. He gives the bad guys back their guns and tells them to get lost, which they do. Fred objects even though they have to freaking carry him, and says he could have taken the guy out with his gun. In this panel, Fred is demanding they give him his gun so he can go back, but they screwed up and the text balloon is pointing at Firefly. Meanwhile, the Joes rightly ask why the bloody hell the Softmaster gave them back their weapons. He explains that desperate, crafty men might come up with more diabolical weapons if given no choice, but they will stick with guns when given them. Yeah, no. I know you can get pretty inventive in the wilderness to get weapons, but assault rifles are still gonna trump anything you could come up with. After fixing up Airborne, by pulling bullets out of him with his bare hands, by the way, the Softmaster says it's time to rescue Snake Eyes, even though he's been vaporized. The guy tells them any ninja worth his salt would have a hiding hole underneath their cabin. How convenient! By the way, we're about seven pages into this comic, not counting ads, and we've yet to see the goddamn dreadnoughts that are featured on the cover! Actually, they show up on page eight. But this comic has about four plots weaving through it, so I'm gonna tackle them one at a time, instead of jumping around like an inebriated monkey. So, back to the mountain. Dave pulled Snake Eyes and the wolf out, and though he's concussed and oxygen deprived, he should be just fine. Yeah, concussions are nothing. Just ask all those professional wrestlers and football players. All those dead professional wrestlers and football players. Yeah, you know what? I got a concussion once when I was 13 years old. It took me two weeks just to be able to eat solid food again. So, when in fiction or reality, people treat concussions like it's just stubbing your toe, it pisses me the hell off. Anyway, Spirit goes off to find food and firewood, even though he's hurt. The healthy fat ninja doesn't go, because as a Native American, of course Spirit is best suited to do that. Meanwhile, Fred, badly hurt, has nonetheless snuck off to finish the Joes, while Destro and Firefly were sleeping. They go after him. Meanwhile, Spirit continues to do his thing. He talks to a random eagle, who shows him the trail of blood Fred is leaving behind. Thank you, Brother Eagle. Ugh, Johnny Depp in a Lone Ranger was less of a stereotype than this. Firefly and Destro are also following the blood, when they come across Spirit, just standing there, not moving a muscle. 
He urges them to be quiet and walk away, but the idiots don't get the hint and cause a massive grizzly bear to wake up. While Firefly and Destro get a lecture about who can prevent forest fires, Fred has gotten back to the cabin. He's confronted by the Softmaster, who bluntly states if he wants revenge on the Joes, he'll have to shoot him first, only for the comic to switch back to the bear. Even within the mountain story, they're jumping around. Spirit, Destro, and Firefly, the latter two having assault rifles they're not using, by the way, are climbing a tree to get away from Yogi. A Firefly drops a satchel charge to kill the beast, but Spirit intercepts it. And here, I have to admit to my own surprise, that Spirit does something shocking that I totally didn't see coming. He says the explosion would bring down the tree. So he jumps down, throws the satchel around the bear's neck, and runs away. The bad guys think he's distracting the bear. But no, he saves his own ass, letting the bear go back to the tree, where it explodes, damaging the thing enough so it cracks, making it careen down the mountain and off a cliff, with Destro and Firefly still on it! Holy crap! Given how stereotypical this guy has acted up until now, I expected some friend of nature bullcrap where he talks to Brother Bear and all that nonsense. But he just straight up kills the animal, attempting to take out the bad guys in the process. That's cold, dude. That's ice cold. Destro and Firefly survive this, because of course they do, by landing tree first into a convenient river. And not on the inconvenient logs just feet away. They get on the logs, and so drift to safety and out of the comic. They should be dead, but whatever. Spirit makes his way back to the cabin, where he finds Fred laying dead. The Fat Master explains he just keeled over. Vengeance was all that kept him going, and when he realized how utterly unsatisfying his revenge was to be, he lost his will and succumbed to his injuries. Yeah, you know what? I think this wise old ninja master is full of crap. Fred has been losing blood all issue. He's also been angry and, yes, vengeful. This would cause his heart rate to increase and his blood pressure to rise, causing him to lose blood faster. So his desire for vengeance wasn't what was keeping him going, it was killing him that much faster. By the time he got back to the cabin, he was probably running on fumes, and his mind was so clouded by blood loss, the master could have told him he couldn't shoot them because his gun was made out of chocolate, and he would have believed him. And this concludes the mountain part of the comic, aka the A story. We still have the B, C, and D story to get through. Give me strength. Okay, here we go in no particular order. There's a brief two-page-long visit to G.I. Joe headquarters, with a stupid thing happening on every page. Firstly, two new Joes are introduced without much fanfare, Rakondo and Blowtorch. They're shoved in the background as Scarlet overhears Duke and Hawk, saying they sent Spirit and Airborne to watch Snake Eyes. She indignantly asks why Snake Eyes needs somebody to keep an eye on him. Well, Scarlet, during this little vacation, he's been shot at, blown up, concussed, and almost suffocated. And that was with two guys as backup. So yeah, I know hindsight is 2020, but Hawk could have justified sending an entire platoon to guard him. Secondly, two more Joes are introduced. Ripcord, who does not resemble anybody from the Wayans family, and Lady J. As soon as her and Scarlet meet, they immediately get into a fight. Yeah, remember way back when Covergirl was introduced? The exact same thing happened. It's like it's impossible for the comic to introduce a female character without having her get into a cat fight. What the hell is up with that? And that's all we see of G.I. Joe headquarters. Time well spent. Can we finally get to some dreadnoughts now, please? Do you know, the dude's on the goddamn cover! Yes, we finally see them, riding on a freeway, until they drive into a truck like this is Knight Rider all of a sudden, for a meeting with Cobra Commander. The cover makes it seem that they'll have an action-packed adventure, riding into battle with their weapons held high. 
The cover is a complete lie! There's no action whatsoever! Okay, to be totally fair, we do see them in action. In a freaking flashback showing panels from issue 30 where they attack Maguire Air Force Base. That's a double insult. Filling space with stuff we've already seen after promising mayhem on the cover. Anyway, Cobra Commander has summoned Sartan and his gang because he wants to hire them as his personal bodyguards, since the guy who had the job last, Storm Shadow, was taken prisoner. So, of course, cue Storm Shadow showing back up. He tells Cobra Commander how he escaped, and I'm just gonna skip it because this review is already too long. The Commander hires him back as his bodyguard, doubling his pay, and promising to reveal who killed his uncle. That's another plot point I skipped during Snake Eyes The Origin, after the big Cobra rally that's coming up. The Commander needs all this extra security because he has finally figured out the Baroness, Major Blood and Destro are out for his blood. You know, I'd call him paranoid, but, well, everybody really is out to get him. As we'll discover in the last storyline of the comic. You see, while all the other stuff is going on, Blood and the Baroness are training Billy to shoot the commander at the rally. He obediently shoots a dummy in the head, but Blood scolds him that he has to empty the gun into the chest. The Baroness shows concern for the kid, and I honestly can't tell if it's genuine or part of the brainwashing they're doing to him. It's a very effective scene and very creepy. It's not THE creepiest bit in the comic, though. No, that comes on the very last page. We're back at the late Fred's house, where a car is pulling up into the driveway. Dad's home! Daddy! You were going away for a week and... Y you're not him. Y you, you look just like him, b but... You're not our daddy! I am now. And... That's how the comic ends! Yeah, Crimson Guards undergo plastic surgery to look alike. And that ending is extremely creepy. Like something you'd see on the Twilight Zone. Genuinely sends chills down your spine. Well, we're finally through with all the story arcs. But we're not done with the comic yet! You see, I'm reading from the original comic again. And even though there's no letter page, uh, probably because this story is already so full, there were two advertisements that caught my eye. Last time, I talked about how Marvel put in an ad for a rival toy line, Mattel's Secret Wars line. Well, believe it or not, there's something even worse. Here's an ad for Transbots. You can buy exciting characters like Transforming Deception Plane, the Leader, and Astro Magnum. And the drawings show Starscream, Bombshell, and a freaking toy accurate Megatron. That's right, in a comic created to sell a line of Hasbro toys, they have an ad for bootleg Hasbro toys. Bruh freaking vo. Try as I might, I couldn't find any pictures of the actual toys online. Just a few images of this ad, with people wondering what the hell they were. So, if any of you out there ever actually bought one of those toys, I want pictures, dammit! The second ad I want to mention is for a G.I. Joe VHS tape. It's feature-length, meaning it's probably the Mass Device five-parter, or the Revenge of Cobra that's just as long. And will you look at the price? It's just $39.95! for a tape, with five cartoon episodes. Yeah, adjusted for inflation, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, that's $87 in today's money. $87! I'm gonna need to put that into, like, all the perspectives. For example, one of the most expensive, read overpriced DVD box sets were the Star Trek The Next Generation ones, released in 2002. They retailed for anything between $100 and $130. Again, adjusting that for inflation, that's about $130 to $160 today. And yeah, that's still way too much, 
but at least you got something like 26 episodes that were 45 minutes long. Not 5 episodes that last 22 minutes. For another example, you can pick up the mass device on DVD right now on Amazon for about 4 bucks. Or you can still buy the 25th anniversary Revenge of Cobra set at online retailers for about 35 bucks, but you get 3 exclusive figures and a Weather Dominator to go with it. Weather Dominator does not actually work. What really gets me about this ad is they have the balls. The sheer devastator sized balls to call this so affordably priced at $39.95 that every kid can own a copy. Yeah, every kid. As long as they already have a trust fund. And that was the mountain. And this issue really was packed to the brim with stuff, wasn't it? Four separate story arcs, four new characters introduced, and the return of Storm Shadow and the Softmaster. Holy crap! I feel like I just went through a seven course meal. And you know what? It tasted great. When the things I bitch about the most in a comic are the advertisements, you know the story itself was a winner. The only part I didn't like, and was completely superfluous, was the goddamn Dreadnought flashback that was only in there to justify the lying, cheating cover art. They could have picked literally anything else in the issue to put on the cover. Like Fred standing over defenseless Joes with his gun. Or the bear attack. Hell, if you still want to have a lying cover, show Billy shooting the Cobra Commander dummy. Instead, we got the Dreadnoughts, who were barely a C-plot. Overall, though, this was a great jam-packed issue I can really recommend. See you next time, everybody!